Good morning. Barry Steinhardt from uh, Friends of Privacy USA. Uh, thanks so much to Lily for uh, for her thank you uh, uh, for the work that uh, Mary Marzuki and I did on these on these first two days. And I want to thank uh, uh, Lily and Jules for uh, uh, being so uh, wonderful to work with, and in particular for putting on such a wonderful conference. This morning's panel is going to discuss negotiations that are now going on between uh, the European Union and the United States over the exchange of personal data uh, in the context of national security, law enforcement, terrorism. Uh, I would take just a couple minutes to put that in some context. Before, we, before I do that, let me just say that we have an excellent panel here. Uh, including uh, uh, people who are directly involved in those negotiations. Uh, all of their bios are uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the CFP uh, site, so I won't take a lot of time introducing them, uh, but I will introduce them briefly uh, before each of them speaks. So let me just take a moment to put this into some context. Uh, these negotiations are important. Uh, because, as you probably know, uh, there have been uh, a series of uh, specific agreements uh, between the United States and Europe uh, over specific kinds of data. Uh, the most uh, famous or infamous of those uh, involve uh, passenger name records, airline passenger records, uh, SWIFT data, SWIFT being uh, financial data, in some respects the Western Union of International Finance, uh, and others. And the negotiations that are going on now are designed to try to reach an umbrella agreement about how that data will be transferred. Uh, they're important for a couple of respects, uh, in a couple of respects. Uh, not only because the data involves uh, sensitive information regarding uh, law enforcement or national security, but because, and I don't think this is well uh, appreciated but by many, so much of the data is, of course, not simply law enforcement or national security data, the way we think of that, but it's, in fact, uh, commercial data, uh, as we've seen from, from other, uh, uh, other uh, instances. Uh, and, uh, and or at least for Americans, speaking from a really provincial point of view, there's an awful lot of our data uh, which is in Europe uh, for one reason or another. Uh, uh, and uh, similarly for Europeans, there's an awful lot of data uh, here in the United States. Uh, secondly, these, these, in many respects, these negotiations, particularly if they're successful, uh, will set a global standard uh, for the transfer of information, personal information, uh, across, uh, across the world. Uh, and I know that people in Asia, Latin America, uh, for example, are looking uh, to these negotiations. Uh, as a potential bellwether. Uh, finally, I'll just say one other thing and, and to put this in some context. Uh, while a lot of the information that is involved here is commercial, because it is collected by government agencies for one reason or another, uh, this, these are not the negotiations about purely private exchanges of data. There are, there are a, a, a second set of, of parallel discussions going on. So, um, we're going to begin, actually, with a presentation from Vivian Redding. Uh, Ms. Redding is the Vice President of the European Union. Uh, she wasn't able to be here with us today, but we have a video presentation from her. Uh, Frank Schmiedel, who is uh, sitting at the end uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the European Union delegation here in Washington, will be participating uh, in the question and answer period uh, at the end. Uh, so, but. Uh, but Ms. Redding, who was, uh, was heading up the European side of the negotiations, was nice enough to provide us with this video. Actually, uh, we'll, st we'll start with a, another perspective from, from Europe. Uh, Jan Philip Albrecht, who's sitting here to my right, is a member of the European Parliament, and he is the rapporteur uh, for the Parliament uh, on these negotiations. So, uh, Jan, why don't we begin with you? Thank and, you. and Jan, we'll, we'll, we'll ask you to speak for about 12 minutes, and I'll let you know at, at, at say, the 10-minute mark when this complaint is left. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And 
Hello from my side. Uh, thank you for that invitation to uh, this very important uh, panel. Um, this is around the sixth or seventh uh, time I visit Washington uh, since the last two years. I'm in European Parliament now, working on those issues, especially privacy issues in. Uh, the law enforcement sector, but uh, privacy issues in general uh, are very uh, interesting in these times. But we, we will hear that there are other panels also dealing with the private sector. Uh, I learned, learned very much uh, during the last two years when coming here, having debates also with Marianne Callahan on uh, the question of uh, privacy and security and uh, the different um, environments of policy making and the different perspectives uh, being around there. Uh, and although there are different perspectives uh, and environments on both sides of the Atlantic, I, I think that um, principles and values are uh, quite similar. Uh, so um, we we share uh, on in the EU and the US uh, principles uh, and. Uh, and values like uh, that the state always has, has to be less intrusive when it comes, for example, to, to fundamental rights intrusions. Uh, that we share the value also of, of fundamental rights, especially uh, also the right to privacy uh, and uh, the principles of rule of law. And I think that uh, this applies, I mean, to the whole range, the private and public sector. and. Um, <coughs> I think that there is um, this this uh, this question was uh, the, or the panel was named uh, a, cl a clash of civilizations uh, a little bit. Uh, I, I have in mind this Huntington uh, debate. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that this uh, this applies really to this situation. I, I think that there is no real clash of civilizations between the U.S. and, in the, uh, and the EU when it comes to values and uh, fundamental principles. Uh, but of course, uh, there are um, a different perspectives existing in the United States and in the uh, European Union. And uh, I have the impression that uh, in the European Union, it seems to be a little bit more uh, vivid, uh, the remembrance to um, situations where those values uh, eroded and those values perhaps were not so present uh, as we wanted to have them. And um, uh, sometimes people question me, especially when I come here, I mean, isn't it uh, a, a little bit strange that you always uh, point out the problem of the public uh, sphere and data procession in the public sphere? when all the people are using Facebook, pu putting their data into the internet and so on. And I am pretty sure that uh, there is a huge difference between the private and the public sector because it's about uh, a, f a relationship between people and state, uh, a relationship which is uh, based on fundamental rights and, um, and checks and balances. and. Uh, that there are reasons also for this. I, I think, I mean, I can choose to uh, be not part of Facebook. I can choose to be uh, uh, not part of online uh, e-commerce, for example. But I cannot choose uh, to be not part of a state, or I mean, unless I want to live in West Sahara or whatever. But um, uh, I, I think there's no problem uh, and no possibility to get out of this. And, uh, and I give uh, a legitimacy to, to my government and to, to my institutions to, uh, and, and give also power, uh, executive power to them to um, enforce uh, principles and, uh, and uh, legislation which I co-decide uh, in a democracy. Um, but to say it uh, crystal clear, I, I don't think that um, uh, there uh, is a problem of fundamental uh, conflict between both sides of the Atlantic. But I see that there's uh, uh, a problem of perspectives in policy making in, in general on both sides. And uh, because both sides, on both sides, we are in favor of effective law enforcement. Also, we are in fa favor of security. Uh, but the question arises, and not only uh, transatlantic, but also on the local level, what is uh, an effective 
uh, law enforcement? What, uh, for example, when it comes to crime rates, what is uh, effective to lower crime rates? Uh, when it comes to, uh, to terrorism, what is uh, effective and uh, um, necessary to, to get uh, uh, less attacks or uh, uh, less uh, dangerous situations? And I think uh, that uh, crime science in the past have shown very clearly that uh, for example, more surveillance measures never really led to less uh, lower crime rates. And that's a very interesting uh, point of view. I, I think that this became a little bit uh, out of the debate, especially uh, here in, in the US sphere uh, in between of the uh, last 10 years where we all went, were effective by 9-11 and also in Europe we had attacks. And in Europe we also had that problem that this uh, uh, priorities, perhaps, sometimes uh, uh, weren't right. And um, I, I say this also because, um, on the other side, democratic engagement and freedom of behavior, for example, and freedom of speech is, is effective by more surveillance measures. And uh, even uh, more if it's uh, invisible or if it's uh, perhaps um, uh, theoretical. I mean, if, if I just, uh, even if I just feel the weight, uh, um, we can see that, that people are changing their behavior. And therefore it should be for both, of, uh, uh, for both sides of the Atlantic, which we share democratic principles and so on, a very uh, important point to, um, instead of, uh, uh, to, to invest in, in, in social security, for example, in education and development, uh, which is doing both, Liar, uh, lowering uh, crime rates on, on the one side and uh, on the other side strengthening uh, democratic society uh, which enables also individuals uh, to create a secure living together. And um, uh, this instead of huge surveillance measures which sometimes are really um, uh, threats to the open society. And I think that, that this is a debate which have ta has taken place in, in Europe very much in the last five to ten years. People got, uh, got engaged in saying, we, we don't want to be part of a policy of fear. We want to have um, uh, a society which is uh, free, where people can, can have uh, their own self-determination and uh, can create a secure society without being surveyed the whole time. And in addition, of course, um, we had in Europe also uh, constitutional courts all around Europe, setting clear red lines for surveillance measures throughout the last years. And especially when it comes to long retention periods uh, for personal information of non-suspects, and uh, also so-called profiling techniques. Uh, this is because Europe has um, this, this is not because Europe has unbalanced privacy laws, I think. I think. This is a result of the um, constitutions and human rights treaties emerged from a devastating presence of fascism and dictatorship in almost all the European countries uh, throughout the 20th century. And I think that this, especially um, uh, me as a German is affecting very much. I mean, uh, especially as a German, I'm deeply thankful for the American people that they helped us to, to overcome the dark times in history. I mean, it's very important that we, and I always, when I came to politics and when I came to my engagement, I always was affected by um, this American view on, on having uh, a, a free individual and a, a, a free society where we all can uh, have freedom of speech and so on. And I, uh, I uh, as I already, already uh, told when I was here in Washington, I, I myself uh, grew up a uh, few kilometers from, from the inner German border and I know what it meant to, to live at the end of the world and, uh, at the, and on the other side the people were not free. And um, I mean, at that at that time, and after, after, for example, the Second World War, we, we Germans and also the Europeans have, have sworn never again. And uh, this means not only never again uh, there should be violence and mass murder, but also never again there should be repressed and unfree people in Europe. And I just tell you this because I think that um, 
what we are struggling for today is exactly, exactly this. And um, uh, I, I don't say, I mean, uh, the EU states and the United States are, are far away from these sort of scenarios, I have to say clearly. But um, people trust the institutions and, um, uh, and they think data processing technology cannot lead to harm. Uh, but I can say uh, Germans and Romanians and Italians and Portuguese, they all trusted their governments and they all, uh, all these governments, uh, or, or they all got dictatorships from time to time. And uh, computerized data procession also, I mean, was, uh, was also used by the Nazis, for example. And, and I, I think uh, to, to get, uh, for example, the Jews uh, in, in Europe, and I, I think that uh, these horrible examples from the past we shouldn't forget and it's very uh, important therefore that we have to build common rules and common standards to protect these liberties and protect these values and um, this is uh, especially because I, I think we, sh we should um, uh, create a society uh, in an effective and sustainable way um, which uh, really gives us the opportunity to not uh, invest much money in, in surveillance measures, but, uh, but use all this money, for example, to invest it in real important uh, programs uh, like social, social security and education and so on. And therefore, I, I'm as the rapporteur for, for the uh, new agreement on data protection uh, between the EU and US, not uh, willing to, fi uh, to fight out any uh, uh, clash of civilizations between the EU and the US. But I'm c I have a clear position in between this policy field which we, which we are, in which we are. But, uh, uh, and, and we have to build up common rules between the EU and the US, because if we watch the global perspective, if we watch uh, the worldwide development, then we have to set up uh, high standards and good rules to preserve our values which we share on both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I, I, I should say that the, uh, it's my fault for not following this closely enough. The, the, the phrase uh, clash of civilizations actually had a question mark behind it after it at one point. Uh, somehow, uh, uh, that got dropped, and I should have uh, heard dog that. But uh, how are we doing here? Okay. Thank you so much, Barry, and uh, and thank you for hosting us and for having us. This is a really important dialogue, and I echo Jan Phillips' comments. Um, I'm going to have a small caveat, which is that. Uh, because I just filled in for David um, at the last minute, I am going to have to step out a little early, and it's not because I can't take the questions, <laughs> but it is instead I have another conflict, actually another speaking engagement. So um, if there are areas where you want to follow up, um, please reach out to me directly, mary.ellen.callahan at dhs.gov. So I just wanted to let you know as I storm out of here at 1020 or so, uh, it's, not because, uh, it's not because I'm not enjoying the conversation. And, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing the Vice President's comments, but at the same time, I think that uh, Jan Philip has done a great job of setting the stage and, and talking about the um, different elements that we're dealing with on the government-to-government -government exchange of information. And, and I wanted to just hit a couple of themes uh, and make sure that my colleagues have time to discuss as well. Um, uh, I think it's really important to remember that we really do have very similar principles for data protection or privacy, whichever way you want to call it and that the, the principles are indeed um, very similar. Uh, if you look at the OECD, which of course is derived initially from the HEW principles that many of you of course are familiar with and that Kim referenced earlier, and that we've had indeed um, decades of successful information sharing with member states and with the United States. We recognize the OECD principles are fair information practice principles derived from the Privacy Act and kind of codified by the Department of Homeland Security, I think in a, in a, in a pretty robust, robust way, are all the, the same basic um, principles and tenet. Um, with that said, I think we need to think about you know, the clash of civilizations. I, I had a similar reaction to, to Jan Philip. I'm like, it's not really a clash. It's like we're family, right? And family sometimes has different approaches to different things. And um, one thing I want, I want um, the audience to think about is I think one of the reasons why we have a difference in application of these principles is we have different um, uh, governmental structures. Right. Um, obviously, the, the European system is primarily a parliamentary-based system where the uh, 
uh, executive is also the ruling party or ruling parties within the legislature, and I think that's an important element to think about, and also explains why they're, they're so focused on an independent data protection commissioner, whether that's on the law enforcement side or that's on the commercial side. You know, usually their uh, data protection commissioners serve both roles. Um, in the U.S. system, as we all know, there are very robust three branches, um, all very active in their different elements. And uh, I think Congress made a decision, um, with the support actually of several people in this room, to first create my office, the Chief Privacy Officer for the Department of Homeland Security, and then to encourage privacy officers in each department. And the idea there being is that we would work um, beforehand to make sure that privacy principles are uh, um, embedded within the system, but then also to, to look after the fact. Uh, I've just written a report actually talking about how I investigated our inspector general for a data breach. Cam was talking about data breaches and how important they are. And I think that that's an important element, but not a dispositive element of privacy protection. But to get the privacy protections in up front, and then also to uh, look at them after the fact. With that said, there is, of course, a great deal of oversight in the United States system, including, uh, of course, the U.S. Congress and uh, the courts, but more specifically, uh, the Government Accountability Office and our own Office of Inspector General, who has indeed investigated me. So it's a, it's a little bit of a quid pro quo, and I think those are important elements to think about when we talk about um, working within a system or working without a system. Um, uh, I briefly, I want to talk about the uh, US-EU negotiations, but I can't say too much because they are indeed ongoing. Um, but the, uh, they are indeed uh, intended to establish mutual recognition for the US and the EU frameworks for privacy. To the acknowledgement of common baseline standards for protection of information, exchange for law enforcement, uh, criminal justice, and public security protections, and for public security purposes, excuse me. And as, um, as, as John Phillips said, uh, our principles are very similar, and these are based on the high-level contact group principles, and I think that that's important. One thing I wanted to kind of uh, differ a little bit with, Barry was talking about how a lot of it is commercial data. That's certainly true in the passenger name records circumstance, which are, are your um, uh, records associated with your, that you provide to the airline that uh, are then conveyed to the United States pursuant to the Aviation Transportation Security Act of 2001. And uh, uh, we are also in negotiations with that to, to uh, revitalize a provisional 2007 agreement. In that circumstance, that is indeed commercial data uh, initially provided to the airline, but then provided to the United States pursuant to its border authority. Much of the other law enforcement information that the umbrella agreement, that's what I'm calling it, or data protection and privacy agreement, BPPA, too many acronyms, so I'm just going to call it the umbrella data protection agreement. Um, those elements uh, primarily aren't commercial data, and, and maybe I'm missing something, Barry, but I just wanted to kind of distinguish that. Um, with that said, as, as he said, having a framework um, in which to engage in government-to-government -government sharing is uh, very important to the United States and important to have that framework and to be the, the leader with our European colleagues um, in terms of government information sharing. And I'll stop at that and uh, look forward to questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm told that uh, we almost have uh, <laughs> Vice President Redding's uh, 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 statement downloaded, but thank you very much, Mary Ellen. Um, uh, the, uh, the next speaker is Edward Hasbrook, uh, uh, who uh, many of you know as the practical nomad uh, and travel expert, uh, but who I think here is here today on behalf of the Identity Project. So and Edward is uh, uh, is, is a great authority, particularly on questions of national name record. Uh, there are other questions that Edward, uh, you've got about 12 minutes. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, and, and thank you, Mary Ellen and, and Frank and, and Jan for all uh, being here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what this uh, umbrella agreement, I think as, as Mary Ellen accurately called it, uh, is. Uh, whose interests it serves, uh, and you know, what would be needed to move it forward, and if I have time, uh, some more specific uh, suggestions about what ought to be included in it. From the start, I think that there's an asymmetry in public and political debate about this issue, which reflects an underlying legal asymmetry in the proposed so-called agreement itself. 
We don't have anybody from Congress here. Many of you probably were unaware that this is going on. There is essentially no public debate about this in the U.S., even while it is the subject of active debate in the European Parliament. Why is that? That is because from the U.S. side, what is being proposed or what is intended to be proposed will be, or signed, will be a so-called executive agreement, not a treaty. So that it can be negotiated in secret, it will not be presented to the Senate for ratification, and it will not be binding on the U.S. or enforceable through any legal mechanism in the U.S. It will have no legal force or effect. From the U.S. side, it will be a press release. However, because it actually will be binding on the European Union, it will have to be approved by the European Parliament, and they're already involved, and there will have to be a public political debate about it. That asymmetry has very important implications. And of course, DHS or the President cannot bind Congress to take any action. We've already seen in the case of passenger name record uh, data and the parallel negotiations for a similar executive agreement there. Congress has stepped in only to enact a resolution saying, we are not going to change any US law with respect to passenger name record data. We're not prepared to give on that. Um, Moreover, there's a further asymmetry in some of the underlying fundamental rights. Well, it's all true that the same <coughs> principles are expressed in both Europe and uh, the US. There's a fundamental difference in the enforceability of those principles. The, the overarching treaty basis that incorporates those principles uh, as they relate to many of the things for which this data is used for is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights which the U.S. ratified with the reservation that it was not self-effectuating and has never acted any, enacted any explicit effectuating legislation for. So the ICCPR is, is, is largely moot in the U.S. and unenforceable. Um, so we have that, that asymmetry uh, where we have a, an agree, proposed agreement that would be enforceable uh, in the EU and potentially could implicate rights that are enforceable now as treaty rights Whereas the treaty rights aren't enforceable now in the U.S., the agreement wouldn't. Where does that leave us? What, why do we have this uh, proposal then, if that's what's going on? Obviously, neither DHS nor other U.S. agencies need this agreement for two reasons. First, because they don't need to overwrite, override the non-existent U.S. data protection law with respect to access to commercial data. There is none, so they don't need any change. Um, and they don't need to override the international covenant on civil and political rights because it's already non-self-effectuating and unenforceable here. The second reason the U.S. government doesn't need this agreement is because they're already getting much of this data already or have other ways that they could de get it. PNR data, European airlines already outsource, and U.S. airlines that operate in Europe already outsource their data hosting to computerized reservation systems based in the U.S. SWIFT had until recently mirror servers in the U.S. with all their financial data. Large amounts of internet e-commerce data communications data, it's all moving through servers and hosts in the U.S. even when it's going between other continents. U.S. government can already get that data without having to go to a European government to get it because the data actually resides or is passing through the U.S. and the U.S. can get it under the Patriot Act from computerized reservation services, banks, uh, telecommunications companies, under those provisions or under FISA provisions already without the need of this agreement. To what degree they, they are, we don't know, um, because of the secrecy of many of those mechanisms. Um, but the DHS is already getting this. So why, and besides which, well, so why, the DHS doesn't need this. Privacy advocates uh, have nothing to gain from this, because the US has already said they're not going to change US law to grant us any more legal rights with respect to privacy or other fundamental rights. And in Europe, Nothing is being proposed that would increase protections under European privacy law. Privacy advocates have nothing possibly to gain from any form that this agreement in its present form might take. So who needs it? Who wants it? The agreement potentially could benefit two groups of people. One, businesses that are already transferring data in the commercial sphere from Europe to the US or outsourcing data operate processing to the US or transferring data directly to the US government, although that's probably the least common of these mechanisms, in violation of existing EU law. 
who know that while EU enforcement authorities have done nothing about this to date, they're at least at risk of liability under EU law. It would relieve that cloud. Uh, it would function then as an immunity law um, to grant them uh, protection against the possibility of enforcement action for the things they're doing now that clearly violate EU data protection law. Uh, secondly, this law would let European data protection authorities who are reluctant or unwilling to enforce their existing laws off the hook for their failure to do their job of policing the existing illegal transfers of data in the commercial sphere particularly, uh, but then by tr uh, to the US uh, by companies that do business in Europe. And although there is a distinction, I think it's a false distinction between commercial transfers and transfers directly to the US government. Given the Patriot Act provisions and the existing mechanisms of US law for government access to commercial data once it is in the US, commercial transfers of data to the US uh, are tantamount to placing the data within the grasp by secret mechanisms without judicial accountability of the US government and need to be treated as such. So I think what we need to think about this proposed agreement as being fundamentally is a law to remove the possibility of liability for businesses that are breaking the EU privacy law in, in their dealings with the US, and to remove even the possibility that EU data protection authorities might take up their existing mandate to impose sanctions against them. And fundamentally, unless the US government is willing to make this a treaty, which was one of, which was part of the uh, EU, uh, the European Parliament resolution on PNR, part of their terms of reference was that it needed to be a treaty that respected the ICCPR. Unless the US is willing to make this a treaty that's binding and to make changes in the US law to comply with it, if the US is unwilling to do anything, the only thing that is being negotiated now is exactly how much of the current protections of European privacy and fundamental rights law will be signed away by the European Union. That no more and no less. Um, so what's needed? The US is not negotiating in good faith. They have no motivation to. Um, this isn't going to be binding on them. And they've already said they're not going to change their laws. What would be needed to actually bring the US to, to a real negotiating table of bargaining? Um, the US is going to need to negotiate if and only if they really fear that US companies are going to feel some pain from enforcement of existing EU law. The pathway to bringing them to the negotiating table is for European data protection authorities and the European Commission itself, which has enforcement uh, uh, responsibility under, for example, the EU Code of Conduct for CRSs, begin to actually impose sanctions Sanctions costly enough to affect the annual reports and the bottom line of those companies. Um, then when they feel that pain, the US will feel the necessity to actually start negotiating in good faith. And everybody knows that if airlines flying from Europe don't provide advance access to their passenger manifests, the US won't let their planes land. There is complete confidence on the US side that nobody in Europe is willing to take comparable enforcement action and refuse to let planes land or let airlines operate there if they're not willing to comply with existing EU data protection law. That has to change. And the initiative, I don't think, unfortunately, is going to come from the Commission or from Parliament. That is going to come, if at all, only through grassroots action by European citizens making complaints to their data protection authorities and demanding that they actually enforce those stronger European privacy laws that sound so good to us Americans in theory but actually have proved hollow, as we've seen, for example, in the complete and total failure of the uh, safe harbor scheme. Um, okay. A couple of things that, if it were a treaty, and if it were based on removal of the US reservations on the ICCPR, um, something that was raised not just by me, but by European NGO witnesses at the hearings on the PNR agreement uh, that uh, Jan Philip uh, chaired uh, last year in Brussels, um, beyond that, um, what would be needed would be to recognize a principle uh, that mere effectiveness in policing is not a sufficient <coughs> argument to satisfy standards of proportionality or, as the ICCPR phrases it, necessity. You know, if you break into everybody's house, have house-to-house -house searches, 
you will find crime in most people's houses. The fact that you would find that does not mean that house-to-house -house searches of people who are not now suspects are justified. And one of the characteristic things about most of the data collection and transfer that would be encompassed by this agreement is that it is not case by case. It is not based on suspicion because there are existing legal mechanisms for acquiring all of this data under existing law enforcement cooperation agreement if there is suspicion, if it is part of a specific investigation. The only reason for new and broadened agreements is to gain access to dragnet surveillance data of non-suspects. Um, it also is uh, intended to require that this surveillance capability in many cases be embedded in commercial infrastructure. And I will not attempt to repeat here, but on this point I would strongly refer all of you to Susan Landau. I don't know if she's here, um, but uh, her new book uh, describing and detailing the threat to security posed by embedding safe surveillance capabilities in information technology uh, infrastructure. So um, I, I, I hope um, that there will emerge the kind of grassroots, uh, grassroots privacy movement in, in Europe that I think we have to a slightly greater degree here. Uh, but without that, I think we need to recognize that uh, while some may see this as an attempt to place under regulation existing unregulated transfers, no good can come of this in its present form, and it needs to be fundamentally reformed in its legal basis to have even the possibility of serving to protect our rights. Thank you. So is uh, give each of the, of the panelists who've spoken this morning and French Friedel, uh, the European Union delegation here in Washington, uh, the opportunity to offer any follow-up comments uh, based on, on what they've already heard. And we'll ask you just to speak for about two minutes, uh, if you could, please. And why don't we just go, basically go in the, uh, uh, in the same order, except we can start with Frank, and it's already with you, um, uh, in place of Vice President Ray. May never hear from. Her. <laughs> no. Of course, I cannot replace her, but uh, I've had a. Uh, I'm going to tell her that you said you were going to replace her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving here, so. <laughs> um, I think maybe a few comments to what Edward uh, Hasbrook has just said. Uh, we have also read with interest the uh, letter that a number of U.S. NGOs have sent to President Obama and to the Congress um, expressing the worry of um, uh, the European Union signing away uh, European privacy rights um, uh, in these negotiations uh, with the US government and by implication also lowering the standard of privacy uh, in, the, in the US. Um, I, I think I'm not quite as, as cynical as, as uh, Edward uh, has been. Um, we are, we are very happy about the vigorous debate currently developing in the United States on the importance of privacy and data protection. Um, and I think we have a chance to, um, to, to, to uh, reach a higher level of, of uh, privacy and data protection on both sides of the Atlantic. If, if we do it right, if we do some creative thinking now, um, as Cameron Carey has said, I think now is the moment, perhaps not only on the side of commercial privacy, but also on the side of um, law enforcement privacy, uh, to engage in some uh, creative thinking across the Atlantic, uh, how we can uh, improve protection for our citizens and our, overcome our differences. Um, let me point out that in the EU there is still a widespread perception that data exchanges have been largely a one-way street over the last years, with huge amounts of personal data of Europeans being gathered by the US authorities. And I keep joking, the US authorities know our citizens better than our own authorities, which, which is probably um, true to some extent. So uh, I think we are right to insist uh, on um, more transparency, I think the US government has already made uh, important efforts in that direction, and we appreciate that. Um, more protection uh, of our rights, of the rights of Americans and uh, Europeans alike, irrespective of nationality or residence, uh, and also more reciprocity. reciprocity. In, in our understanding, um, 
that would mean more sharing of the derived intelligence from these data to prevent security threats and counter security threats. And uh, we are building our own similar systems now. Um, so sooner or later, we might actually come to your door and ask for your data. And then uh, we would expect uh, reciprocal treatment, of course, as well. So um, I think if, if we engage in this um, creative thinking and, and find solutions um, that can satisfy our, our um, respective legal orders and, and political constraints, uh, I think we, we, we can make these data exchanges that are taking place and I'm afraid won't go away, um, can make these exchanges both legally and politically sustainable for the future and perhaps uh, also increase them in, in duly justified um, uh, circumstances. So, um, from the European perspective, I would say, um, if you allow me to paraphrase uh, President Kennedy, I don't always ask when it comes to data protection and data what uh, Europe can do for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, um, uh, ask yourselves what you can do for Europe to, to assuage our concerns. Thank you. <laughs> There's a great irony that, uh, that the first reference to President Kennedy came not from uh, Mr. Kerry, but from our European friend here. <laughs> uh, I wanted to hear the Boston accent, though. That, that would have been great. <laughs> uh, Mary Ellen, did you want to? Sure. Want, you want to go next? Yes. Absolutely. Happy to. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you. This is really a very interesting and important conversation, and I want to uh, thank everyone for being here. Um, I, I had uh, just a couple of thoughts um, based off of. Uh, the, the following comments. Um, you know, the interesting question is, is uh, Frank said, you know, the U.S. government may know the EU citizens better than the European Union uh, member states do. I'm not necessarily so sure about that because one of the things that's interesting in having the umbrella conversation and, and also just generally in, in my role as the uh, DHS privacy officer to get to know the European system, um, one of the big things that you guys use from law enforcement perspective is wiretaps which we can't use except in, in uh, very specific circumstances, but in, in, in Europe the, the number of wiretaps is literally thousands of times more than in the U.S. side, which is uh, a, a way to get to know your citizens pretty well. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fair point because, um, uh, you know, we, we talk about these kind of fundamental rights, and, but what I try to do in my job every day is what does that mean in, in application? In principle, we've got these, these principles, but how does that work in, in application every day? And, and what's the enforceability of rights? That's one of the things that, that Mr. Hasbrook talked about. And what are the, uh, how, how are they enforced and how are they, they not enforced? You know, um, for example, many of you probably know that when you go to, to the European Union, your information, if you stay in a hotel, is likely transferred to the police for some reason, right? We're not 100% sure, we're not 100% sure how long they keep it, depending on the member state. But I think that that's something I'd want to know and probably would want to, to hear about. And, and I guess, who do you go to to ask that information about? Who do you ask to access your information and to see if you can correct it in that circumstance? And I think it's worthwhile, um, you know, Frank talked a little bit about transparency. It is something that I like to talk about a lot and I, I really, I really think that, that uh, CFP is a really important dialogue because it is about transparency and it is about making sure we're doing the right thing and it is about having the conversations to, you know, uh, uh, Edward asked for, you know, grassroots in the European Union. Well, you guys already are here and, and for that we really appreciate it. Um, but I think that uh, the U.S. actually leads on transparency in terms of what we do and what we don't do and what, how we disclose information, our privacy impact assessments and the system of records notices and the comments that you guys provide. And I'm wrapping up, aren't I? Okay, so <laughs> anyways, I think that, that we've got to learn a lot that we can learn on both sides. The end, Barry. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to... Uh, um, uh, get further a little bit I, uh, on my comments. I, I think, I mean, you heard from uh, Frank Schmieder that um, we are all obviously also working on our own uh, data uh, analyzing systems and so on, and that's exactly what I said. I mean, uh, uh, I, I have a politi political position, political standpoint inside Europe, and, uh, and I guess this is uh, a debate which we have on both sides of the Atlantic to the, uh, at the same time. And uh, I mean, 
I think we would be stupid if we just uh, let some Europeans do the work on uh, on privacy and civil liberties also, because it's um, it's a thing we have to do on both sides of the Atlantic now. And uh, uh, I, I can see that at the moment uh, the Europ uh, Europeans are also um, going in the direction of measures which the US, for example, took up since 9-11. And there's one very important point, which is uh, exactly what Edward uh, mentioned also, and uh, that is the difference between um, <laughs> the classical law enforcement and information sharing agreements, which, uh, uh, agreements which are based on analyzing and uh, using uh, d information and data of suspects, known suspects, and uh, uh, the new form of investigating uh, with a electronic analyzing on an electronic analyzing way, uh, uh, using blanket retention data, and uh, of course, uh, it's using this data also doing profiling and so on is something which police ever did. But I think there's a huge difference between uh, looking face to face to a police officer, seeing the police officer, being examined by him, and having the possibility to also afterwards uh, ask for redress or information about all these processes, and on the other side, being analyzed uh, without knowing about this or without be having this present by a black box, uh, by a computerized system, and afterwards, uh, a policeman just takes the result and judges me or, or treats me uh, on the basis of such results. I think that, uh, that has to do with foreseeability. And foreseeability is for a legitimate uh, um, a government and uh, an institution um, and for democracy a fundamental principle. And that's uh, why I really uh, think that we have to talk about all these techniques which we are using and about the vast amount of uh, data which we are analyzing for law enforcement purposes. Thank you very much, John. And uh, uh, Edward? Uh, yep, we've had a lot of discussion about data protection, but I think it's really important to understand that the fundamental rights at stake in this discussion are not only, and I would argue, not primarily data protection rights. And that's one of the reasons why it's essential and why the European Parliament said in the pre and context it's essential to get the ICCPR into this debate. It's part of the terms of reference. Data are used, and there are data protection rules about how the data are protected from disclosure and so forth. But also, data is used, data transferred on a screen, will be used in ways that will impact people's fundamental rights. It will be used to make decisions about whether or not to let them on a plane, whether or not to let them transfer money, uh, whether or not to subject them to a variety of other consequences. And it's essential that we recognize that there are other fundamental rights implicated by the decisions that will be made in whole or in part on the basis of this data. Thus far, as I understand it, the U.S. side has been willing only to talk about saying we won't make certain kinds of decisions solely on the basis of this data, as though the, the, the slightest human rubber stamping of a robotic decision was sufficient to justify it. That's not good enough to, standard, to satisfy due process or fundamental rights standards, and we need to recognize both the data protection rights and the other rights implicated by whatever decisions are made to any degree on the basis of this kind of data. For the questions and answers in a moment, we're hopeful first to be able to see the clip from, uh, uh, from uh, Vice President Redding, but I was going to suggest actually uh, the opportunity to leave at 1020. Uh, that you, I have questions I was going to pose to you, but why don't you go ahead and then I'll post Ladies to you. Ladies and gentlemen, no, she's I'm done. <laughs> the United States and the European Union have a long-standing cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs. Information sharing is essential to fight crime, but when combating terrorism, we must not forget our citizens' rights. These rights must be protected also when it concerns the gathering of personal information for security purposes. <coughs> the US and the EU are now negotiating a data protection agreement for law enforcement purposes. Our privacy systems are not identical and we are trying to overcome gaps and discrepancies. We try to set up a solid common standard. We try to secure data exchanges over the Atlantic. 
For the European Commission, it is crucial that we can agree not only to share personal data, but also to protect such data. Also for our Parliament, a comprehensive data protection agreement with legally binding data protection standards and enforceable rights of citizens is essential for any transatlantic data sharing. Since the end of March, our negotiators have held positive and constructive talks on a number of complex issues. The negotiations are not easy, precisely because the matters at stake are closely linked to the constitutional and legal order of both sides. But I'm confident that we will find ways to ensure coherence and legal certainty. We can build on our well-established cooperation to achieve a real step forward in protecting the personal data of American and European citizens. Today's conference is a good opportunity to discuss privacy and data protection issues in the Internet area. I appreciate your interest very much. The US-EU agreement is in the hands of policymakers, of course, but specialists, practitioners, technologists, academics and businesses who are all present at today's conference have an important role in supporting internet diplomacy and fundamental rights. I wish all of you a very successful conference and very fruitful debates. I do want to give you an opportunity to, uh, to make your point. Uh, then if you could hold on for one minute beyond that, I would ask Justin. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, I could, uh, I'll go to like, 10.23 for you, Barry. Right. <laughs> um, the only point I wanted to make was uh, one I forgot, as both well John Phillips and Ed did, which is it is the United States' intent to have the umbrella agreement cover both um, uh, case-specific sharing, case-by-case -case sharing, as well as uh, more comprehensive program-based sharing. That's all. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move to the question and answer period, sure. uh, but I was going to take the moderator's prerogative here and ask the first question. Uh, and. Uh, First to you, Mary Ellen, and then I ask, ask that uh, our European uh, friends here uh, also take a crack at this, which is I know one of the concerns that, that I heard uh, from Europeans about this agreement uh, and about the transatlantic exchange of data in general is a concern that once data is transferred from Europe to the United States, uh, that it will that it will be that once it gets to the hands of the United States government that there are insufficient protections for, for the onward transfer of that data, uh, either to other elements of the United States government uh, or to the private sector. And I'm wondering if you, you could address that. Yep, thanks, Barry. And that is uh, a, a comment I've heard on my, on my trips to Europe, and one that I don't think is uh, appropriately placed. Um, as we all know, the United States has uh, specific reasons and authorities, specific authorities in how it collects information, how it uses information, and what those uses are. And the, uh, the, there's a kind of myth in the United States, or in the EU, that there's one big database, right? And that, that uh, you know, I think even Edward kind of alluded to it, that the US government gets Google data and we also give data to Google, right? Neither of those things happen, let me be very clear. <laughs> But with that said, the, the, um, the system of records notices, the disclosures, the ability to, um, uh, under, the, under Department of Homeland Security mixed systems policy, to, uh, to ask uh, where your information is and how it's being used are all protections, including, of course, routine uses under system of records notices. And we take those responsibilities quite seriously. And in fact, I, I uh, go and confirm that, indeed, the statements made in our public statements, such as SORNs and PIAs, are indeed accurate. And so. The, uh, the, the fear that there, this is, is just become one big database is unfounded. No, Frank, I'm, I'm going to ask the, the European government officials to respond first, and then Edward will give you a shot. Did, anything you want to add to that, Jan? I think that when it comes to, to onward transfers, um, especially um, in, in between the institutions and also uh, uh, with third states, it's it's very important that in uh, in Europe there's a very strict um, 
a perfect limitation. It's mm -hmm. a very strict uh, um, set of possibilities to, to process uh, personal data. And sometimes uh, we even have really forbidden links. I mean, uh, in Germany, derived from our historical experience, we had a separation between intelligence and police. This already is overcome uh, over the European uh, level, or, uh, although we Germans don't, wouldn't admit that this is overcome already, uh, uh, because, uh, for example, Europol is connecting uh, uh, this information already. But um, I think that there is a concern about the question: who is uh, uh, who is deciding at the end if data has to be uh, disclosed to to other institutions or to third states, and therefore. Uh, I, I think that Europeans uh, would insist on, on having also um, the, the originator to, to also give, uh, have an op opportunity to co-decide if data is uh, tr uh, onwards transferred or not. And in addition, it's very much uh, very important because we have this experience out of our old directive, uh, our, our data protection directive in the private sector. When it comes to onward uh, 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 transfers, then we, we always talk about adequate data protection. And I think in our times, it is very much important to really define what is adequate and to define principles when also doing onward transfers, especially to third states. Because otherwise, I think uh, our, our systems and principles uh, also, in between the EU, US and the EU, will erode because there are other uh, uh, other frameworks, other legal uh, systems uh, working in the world. And I think if, if we uh, open up these, uh, it would be uh, very problematic. Do you want to add anything, Craig? Um, onward transfers are indeed problematic and need careful attention. Um, and as Jan has said. Um, when we created the uh, privacy directive for the private sector in 9546, um, we, we had this adequacy requirement uh, that you could transfer um, data from Europe to uh, other countries only if those uh, um, privacy protections in those countries were deemed to be adequate in our view. It was not to bother our partners actually, it was to prevent the circumvention of the European rules by simply um, transferring the data to another country and then you can do what you want. So that was the original intention uh, of, of uh, this adequacy requirement when it comes to third countries. And it is still a concern to which countries our data go and how they are protected there. And when we have these specific agreements uh, on PNR or on TFTP, I mean, this is always a very difficult point of the negotiations. Thank you. So, or uh, June, Marianne, perhaps I, I can just also add something which is mentioned by, by Edward. I mean, the, the fact of the existence of the Patriot Act is always or has always a, been a big challenge to us to accept uh, uh, quite the adequacy. And, and it challenges me right now uh, because this would be, you know, that this would be impossible in, in a European constitutional framework. And therefore, it's, uh, it's over also really a question. Uh, to, to, to all these measures, how they fit in, in such a framework. Um, that, that, if I can, Barry, just because I'm wrapping up, I think that, that's a, a very fair point and one that we'll try to be more transparent about um, in terms of the usage. But in terms of you know, uh, having the originating country know if there's any onward transfer, absolutely, completely agree. I think that's very important. And to make sure even, so we have to go and make sure that if, if indeed, we don't do all that often, but if indeed we do transfer to a third part, a third country, we have to go and say, you know, check that we don't like the word adequacy because the U.S. is inadequate, but that's okay. And, and by the way, talk about self-worth, right? I'm not adequate. What does that mean? But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but we have to make sure that the same standards and, and so on are applied. So I completely, 100% agree with Philip, uh, Jan Philip. And on that note, there is no clash of civilization, so I have to go. <laughs> no, if we just. I'm going to ask Edward to, to come in in a moment, but while we're doing that, if you have a question, please call to the microphone, uh, and we'll take questions for about 20 minutes.
Uh, so, uh, Edward? Yeah. On, on your point as to the uh, onward transfers, in the U.S., transparency, if any, with respect to onward transfers of government data is provided by the provisions of the Privacy Act for what's called an accounting of disclosures. However, DHS and most other U.S. agencies have exempted virtually all law enforcement data uh, databases from the accounting of disclosures provisions of uh, the Privacy Act. I won't ask Mary Ellen to comment on pending litigation, but it's a matter of public record that in my current Privacy Act lawsuit against the DHS related to their refusal to provide uh, either uh, much of my uh, airline reservation data that they have or an accounting of, of disclosures, their position is that even for U.S. citizens, the whole system of records has been completely exempted from any access or accounting of disclosure requirements under the Privacy Act. And that's true for most law enforcement databases. So, are there questions? <laughs> Microphones on either side, in either, either aisle. Uh, if not, this is uh, CFP first. <laughs> uh, thank you. Kaiser Sunil, this Panopticum, Poland, Europe. If there are no questions, I'll, uh, I allow myself one not directly related to what you've been talking about, but in the description you mentioned of the panel, you mentioned there will be some discussion on private entities, and this is my my point of concern, we've talked a lot about uh, governmental exchanges of data. I wonder if speakers have any views on on the chances of making US-based companies obliged to European standards on data protection. I heard from some insiders that uh, FTC is talking with uh, big companies in the US about the change of their policy, but are there chances of, of that change really happening and what political factors would you see uh, speeding up the change, if any? Thank you. Uh, anyone want to take a break at that? I would say that you will see uh, changes by U.S. companies when they are forced to. And by that, I do not mean when a law is enacted. I mean, if a compliance officer comes to the board of a U.S. company and says, there's some law that says we're supposed to do something in some other country. Do they do it? No. They say, well, what's it cost us if we don't? They will comply when they see them or their competitors suffering legal sanctions for non-compliance sufficient to impact their bottom line. So it goes back to what I said before. We'll see movement in the private sector. Most U.S. companies have ignored the EU Data Protection Directive and continued to operate in Europe as though it didn't exist. And they'll start changing if and only if and when they start being hit with painful sanctions by EU data protection authorities. Yeah, I, I think that um, at the moment, as we are uh, re revising our own data protection framework in Europe, uh, this question arises that there has been uh, a directive which would be applied to situations where U.S. companies are acting in Europe and uh, uh, offering their services uh, to Europeans. Uh, there are provisions in, direct, in this directive, and uh, often it's questioned if the, all those uh, uh, provisions are fulfilled. And therefore, we as the European Parliament uh, are following the uh, uh, Commissioner, which we just heard, Commissioner Vivian Reding, uh, on uh, the question how to improve this. Uh, that uh, companies who are offering services in the European Union, of course, have to comply with European Union data protection rules, and that uh, European citizens also, when taking uh, uh, services, for example, in Europe, uh, uh, can trust that European data protection legislation will be applied uh, uh, then. I, I think that this is not um, a question of uh, a fundamental question. This is a question of how to enforce and how to uh, really, um, uh, uh, yeah, how, how to how to really com comply uh, uh, with our own uh, legislation. And I think that at the moment we are debating on several uh, things, also especially on the question of applicable law. And uh, obviously, uh, there are many people in, in Europe who think that uh, if we don't want to have a race to the bottom, 
uh, in favor of big companies, then we need to have um, a strong provisions on the applicable law when offering services. Michael, you identify yourself? Yeah, Michael Ostroy, Campaign for Liberty and Liberty Coalition. Uh, where can we find out more about this agreement, specifically, Ed, your perspectives on this? Uh, I work with the Identity Project. Our website is at papersplease.org, and three or four entries down in the blog, there's a long white paper analyzing the draft of the PNR agreement, which is only a subset, but basically, I think, raises all of the same fundamental issues as the umbrella agreement. I would just add that actually the, the letter that was referenced earlier uh, that was sent by a number of organizations uh, to uh, President Obama and the Congress, which will give you a fair amount of background, uh, it, the easiest way to go, again, is go to the Center for Democracy and uh, uh, Digital Democracy, Center for Digital Democracy's website. It's, it's right, I know it's right there, probably on some of the other organizations, the ACLU signed on, uh, EFF signed on, I believe, so there are other organizations like um, Stephanie Perrin, University of Toronto. Um, very interesting, thank you. Uh, I'm interested in what's going on in Europe with respect to the discussion of the directive in the context of law enforcement. Now, I understand this is basically starting and that this will be a longer discussion. Um, has Euro just tabled a paper, said anything, made a comment on the coverage with respect to the directive? Euro just. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen anything from Euro just on this, but um, I mean, we have we have now uh, two ongoing processes, which is uh, the revision of our own uh, data protection framework of the old directive, over 1995. A directive and uh, uh, also uh, setting up a uh, um, horizontal framework. This means that data this data protection framework will be applicable for the private and the public sector, uh, of course with some different rules, but generally the same principles will apply. And the second thing is the uh, EU-US data protection agreement on law enforcement. And we have several uh, debates uh, going on, but uh, and our institutions, of course, also the agencies, are contributing to the process uh, of the revision uh, towards the European Commission. And perhaps Frank can uh, follow up with some background to this. But otherwise, there will be the draft legislative uh, proposal uh, on this revision in autumn. Question over here. Pamela Jones Harbor, Fulbright, and Jaworski, former uh, Federal Trade Commissioner. Uh, I was wondering if uh, those on the panel could address the e cookie directive. I know in mid May the Article 29 Working Party had an opinion on, uh, on, on this, and it became law last month. But the way it was reported here, it is a bit hazy uh, in, in with, with respect to how it will be enforced. And what effect it will have on American companies doing business in Europe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not really familiar with this either, but as I understand, it's about um, giving uh, consumers, uh, internet users, uh, the possibility of an informed choice uh, if they want to have cookies uh, planted on their computers or not, and, and uh, strengthening the rules uh, in Europe uh, on that compared to um, what has been happening so far. So um, I think, as has been said before, implementation uh, has been a challenge in Europe, uh, and this has been recognized, and uh, the intention is to address this in the reform of the privacy directive to make it at the same time more streamlined, more user-friendly, more, more easy to implement, but then also make sure the implementation actually takes place. I would nevertheless um, uh, put a bit of a question mark on Edward Hasbrook's remarks that uh, nothing is implemented and, and is, is completely ignored. Um, I mean, I repeatedly um, see these um, reactions from, from companies, including big companies, um, when they get simple letters from our data protection authorities. They, they just get a letter of inquiry, but we have heard you're doing this and that. And they seem to get fairly nervous about this. So if um, this was all a tiger without teeth, 
I think then um, we wouldn't have those uh, reactions and and, um, and and this this nervousness. Um, this being said, I think uh, we, we have to be better on the uh, implementation side. This is where we can probably learn a few lessons also from uh, best practices in some parts of the U.S., uh, including in the administration. Um, uh, I think here on the U.S. side, uh, we have to um, perhaps look a bit more closely at principles and across-the-board protection. I didn't really reply to your question, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> one one follow-up question. Uh, it was also reported here that even though the rules are in effect, companies will have a year to get their houses in order, and what they should be doing, it was reported, is assessing uh, their uh, privacy policies in-house and start thinking about how they would comply. That's what we heard they should be doing now. Is, is that an accurate uh, articulation of uh, complying? Um, I, I hope you still have my card, otherwise I give it to you again. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll forward that question to my colleagues in Brussels, what the exact um, state of the play at the moment. Mm. Thank you. If, if I may share just my own experience by way of perspective on you know, how good the situation is when you appeal. Um, my last several trips to Europe, I've asked the airlines, all European airlines, uh, for my PNR data and what they've done with it. Um, all have argued strenuously, uh, none of them have provided it until after I've complained to the data protection authorities. All of them have argued strenuously with the data protection authorities that they aren't required to provide it. One ultimately uh, just said you know, the data protection authority gave up and the airline said, you want to do anything, you got to sue us. One data protection authority never answered me at all. And only in one case, which uh, was the uh, German Data Protection Authority for uh, Nordrhein-Westphalia, just yesterday I got my PNR data from Lufthansa because they had ordered Lufthansa to turn it over a year after my flight, a year after my original request, and only after I got the Data Protection Authority involved. Two out of three cases I got nowhere. So sometimes it works it's better than nothing, but it's not what it's supposed to be. Okay, so seeing no other uh, persons at the, uh, at the microphones, I think we'll wrap up. I just want to get uh, the remaining panelists here an opportunity to say uh, anything in conclusion you'd like to say. Anyone want to add anything? No? No? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I can just uh, try to, to explain. Of course, we, we were talking now on the public uh, data process, uh, processing and the question how to uh, share data for law enforcement. I, I just think that we need to have uh, uh, a stronger data protection framework on both sides of the Atlantic, a common framework. I mean, the globalization, the digitalization forces us uh, to, to have common rules because otherwise at the moment we are revising our European framework. But uh, at the end, the enforcement problem will stay because, of course, the internet, at least uh, in the private sector, will not end up uh, at, the, at the European borders. And in addition, uh, as we are all fans of the Arab Revolution and the open internet, uh, we will not uh, just do censorship at, at our borders if uh, data protection rules are not in compliance. Yeah. So we need to uh, have common rules. We need to come up with transatlantic data protection framework. And therefore, we need also data protection uh, activists and privacy groups being active on both sides of the Atlantic. And I can just thank you for this panel. Uh, and uh, thank you, Barry, uh, to, to organize this, because it's very important to, uh, to get in contact with uh, each other. And it's very important to, to build up alliances uh, across Atlantic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jan, for taking part in this. Thank all the panelists, and, and uh, uh, I'll again convey all our thanks to, to Mary Ellen Callahan. So we're going to wrap up. Uh, I know at least Jan, and I suspect Edward, uh, uh, if you can nod in a sense that this is correct, uh, will be, uh, uh, be staying behind uh, on, the, on the podium for a little bit uh, during the coffee break uh, if you want to ask additional questions. We particularly ask uh, that if you are a member of press uh, and you'd like to ask a question, uh, that you come up and just identify yourself so we can make sure uh, that you have an opportunity to ask your question. So thank you. Thank you all.